The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. For more information on Shiloh Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at shilohopc.org. Let us hear God's infallible and authoritative word. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that is in my imprisonment, it is for Christ. But most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed And in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. And thus far in the reading of God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to ask you to bless your word to us. May we, like the apostle, end by rejoicing in every way we can in your goodness and mercy to us. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. There are certain attitudes we have to the issues that we face. And those attitudes very often betray the kind of people we are. Sometimes our attitude is pessimism. There are some people who, like the, um, the drunkard, um, uh, sees every bottle as half empty. That when you talk to them, everything is woe and darkness and pointlessness. And we can be that even though we might be not of that personality. You know, the, you, you say to someone, well, that's good news. Well, yes, you wait. I mean, you know, a couple come to you and say, uh, we want to be married, and you, you share that with, with someone. And they say, oh, well, if only they knew. And it's, it's sometimes a, a dreadful plague upon our conversation. Now, there are other people who see the bottle as half full. They're optimists. And sometimes optimists are really careless in their optimism. Think nothing is wrong, everything is fine, all is going well. And that's a plague as well. But there must be a middle way, and there is. And it's what I call Christian realism. And this is exemplified by the Apostle Paul in the passage that I've just read to you. The Apostle Paul has been a missionary, and he'd been to Philippi. And he'd preached to the Philippians, and it had seen great success. People had been converted. A church had been established. And he'd stayed there for a period of time in order to appoint officers, elders, pastor, and so on. But then he'd gone on his travels like a a good missionary, feeling called to his work. He'd gone. And that had resulted in great trials. He had been taken uh, captive. He had uh, been uh, ultimately sent on to Rome with a view, obviously, of of execution. Now, it appears that this was not the point at which he died. He died later. He was released, died later. But at this point, he's imprisoned. And the Philippians are concerned. I'm, I'm sure the same would be true for all of you. Well, I hope it would be true for all of you. If, if I was taken captive by the, the authorities and, and they said they were going to shoot me and, um, and that some of you at least would be concerned. Some of you would say, oh, well, that's good riddance. And, uh, 
um, and let's get him out of the way. But, but some of you, some of you, my grandchildren, I've got a load of those in this congregation, may, maybe they would say, oh, it would be sad to lose Tide, grandfather. Uh, maybe some of the rest of you would. But this is the way the Apostle Paul reacts to their concern. They're concerned for him. He wants to comfort them. And he uses Christian realism to do so. And he does so in three ways. First of all, he tells them that he recognizes divine sovereignty. That God rules over everything. Look, he says to them, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He rejoices in divine sovereignty. This is the plan of God. This is the way it was meant to be. He has the opportunity to tell people about Christ. He has the opportunity to proclaim Christ. He's able to speak about Christ, even to the Praetorian Guard, which was the elite force that protected the president, or the Caesar in this case. And he was able to tell them that this imprisonment was not something that was a problem to him, but to the contrary, it allowed him to tell them of the good news of Jesus Christ dying for their sins. What a great message he had, because he believed that God ruled his life. We need to grasp that, I think, very often, that, that our lives are not our own. Our lives belong to God in us, and that he rules over us. He has everything in his hand. Not a hair falls from your head, no matter how bald you are this morning. Not a hair falls from your head, but that he has order over it. He sees the sparrow fall. He sees the sunshine. That, that when we hear of storms, he has ordered it. When we have a beautiful day like today with beautiful sunshine, he has ordered it. That it was bitterly cold last night, he has ordered it. And Paul says to us, as Christian realists, this is something we must hold on to, that God rules everything. And that's our comfort, and that's our encouragement. Whatever you're facing this morning, whatever situation that's come to you, let me assure you that God in heaven knows about it, has ordered it, and has intended it for your good and for his greater glory. <laughs> The second thing the Apostle Paul sees here is that Christian realism ac accepts divine priorities. <clears throat> Read vi verses 15 through 17. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, and others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to add to my affliction in my imprisonment. Now, whatever happens, he doesn't say that these people who are against him are not preaching the gospel. They're doing it from a different motive. But nonetheless, he says, this is a divine priority, the extension of his kingdom. You know, that's what God is all about in this world. He's not in our world to make life comfortable for us and for us to feel things are good and, 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 and we're making progress and uh, we're getting enough set on one side for, for, for retirement and, uh, and all those nice things. His concern is the spread of the gospel. And you have got to see yourself in that plan. You've got to see yourself in that plan. You've got to understand that the way you react and the way you live and the way you teach and the way you think is for the extension of God's kingdom. Are you doing a good job at that? Are you proclaiming the kingdom in the way that you talk to each other, talk to your neighbors? It, it's not a question of do you tell them about Jesus? Of course, that should be at the back of your mind always. Tell them about Jesus. 
but ultimately, it's the way you react to them. I remember an old man, he was, was an old man, he was 90 years of age, a member of a congregation that I pastored <coughs> in Wales, my first congregation. And Mr. Harris was a, a, a fine man. Um, he had suffered from a lack of good teaching, but he was a fine man. And I remember him telling me once that he uh, remembered a, a saying that he'd heard from some preacher or read in some place or other, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. No, I don't agree with that entirely. But I do believe that there is a point there. Do people see sermons in you? What you hear each Lord's day, do they see it worked out in your life? Do they see it in your conversation? Do they see it in the way you deal with your family, your children, your parents, the way you deal with your husband or your wife? Do they see it in you? When people come into your home, do they see a sermon of God's grace and love and mercy? See, this is what Paul is talking about. Here he is stuck in prison. And some people, as a result of him being there, preaching. Some preaching maliciously, wanting to add to his burden. And whatever they're saying, ultimately they want Paul to suffer. He's glad. He doesn't care. As long as gospel is preached. Others are preaching out of love and concern for him and for his message. And he rejoices in that. Divine priorities must take precedence over everything else that we say or do. And Christ's name must be glorified at all points. And the third thing we see here is that biblical realism acknowledges divine purposes. Look, he goes on to say, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. I'm not going to bow, he says, to any of these circumstances. I am going to be faithful. I am going to hold fast to the gospel because I know that there are, there's a divine purpose behind what I'm going through at this time. Whatever people do, he says, I am prepared to go with what God would have me do. And it's well for us to remember that. It's something that we need to hold on to with all our strength, that whatever our circumstances, there's a divine purpose. And the way we talk and the way we react and the way we interact, interact with, with, with others and, and with our families in particular. Look, my friend, if I came into your house unexpectedly, what would I see and hear? In Wales, where I come from, ministers develop the habit of going in through front doors. You know, knock on the front door. It's the minister. <sighs> Clear everything. He's coming in. So I became a backdoor visitor. <laughs> that is very effective. You knock on the back door and you can't get everything out of the kitchen before I get into the house. <laughs> and, and I did it and I've done that. I, I don't do it as much now. I'm getting a little older and uh, getting out and about is not so quite so easy. But that to me was an eye-opener. It was an eye-opener for the way in which people reacted in their life. Your children. Oh, don't children... Aren't children honest, more or less? They, they, they act in a certain way, and, uh, and, and, and you realize that uh, the gospel hasn't quite clicked with them, and their parents are not concerned about it. You'd say to the children, did you hear what I said on Sunday morning? And they'd go, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, grow, you know, 12, 13 year old, they don't know. But that's a favorite phrase of 13 year olds. So do you know? I don't know. They don't know anything. They don't know anything at all. But what was important that in constant appearances at the back door, 
led to people being more faithful in teaching their children and in acting in a way that was in, in, in the purposes of God. And this is what Paul is saying. Biblical realism sees divine purposes and acknowledges that God is at work, that he has a purpose in what he does, and that that purpose is to the edification of his people and the growth of his kingdom. Now let me say a couple of things by way of application. We need to finish so that we need to start, as it were. We need to finish so that we can get the, our congregational meeting on the road. But I want to say four things to you. All our comfort is lost without biblical realism. You become an optimist and you'll get disappointed. You become a pessimist and things never look good. Everything looks bad. Biblical realism gives us real hope. All comfort is lost without it. Let me point you to a living example, as it were. Joseph. Remember Joseph being thrown into prison at 17 years of age, into the captivity of the, of the Egyptians, into prison for a number of years, between the ages of 17 and 30. He's either in slavery to Potiphar or he's in prison in, 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 Her in, in Pharaoh's prison for 13 years. How could he keep up his hopes? Biblical realism. Biblical realism. God had a purpose in this. He can say to his brothers later on, you meant it for evil for me, but God meant it for good. He was a biblical realist. What's your philosophy? What's your approach to life? As it says, is it fatalism? It's not fat biblical realism is not fatalism. It's not, it's not saying, oh, whatever will be, que sera, sera. It's rather saying there is behind every circumstance a divine power, a divine hand, a hand of love and truth and righteousness. And this was Joseph. And so he kept his comfort. He still believed God right at the end. He says to Pharaoh, I can't interpret dreams. God will open my eyes to it. He will tell you. He kept his faith because he was a realist. God was at work in his life. And that's something for us to remember. You will have no comfort. You will have no comfort if you're not a biblical realist. You will have no comfort if you don't have Christ, of course. You will always be battling, wondering, hoping, thinking, maybe. But if you have Christ, you will know that you have life eternal. The second thing is this. Our confidence in God's providence is a witness to the comfort of others. Paul can say to his readers, I have learned that in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. Isn't that a comfort to people? People inquire of you, how are you feeling? Well, I'm down, oh, I'm ill. You know, a hundred times you hear it. Paul says, I believe I'm a Christian realist. I believe things happen for good. All things happen for good. Therefore, he says, I have learned. And it's a learning process. It's not something that comes like magic into your eyes and into your life. It's something you have to learn. You're disappointed with where you've been placed in your work. You're disappointed with the people you have to work with. You are disappointed with having to leave family and friends. I have learnt. He was a biblical realist. I have learnt that whatever happens to me, God has a divine, glorious purpose to encourage me and to keep me and to bring about the spread of the gospel. That's for you. You may say, well, I'm not a missionary. No, you're not. Yes, you are. You're not ordained as a missionary. You have not been to seminary. You have not learnt uh, uh, methodologies. But you're a Christian. And as a Christian, wherever you are, you are a missionary for the gospel. And how will you do it? I have learnt 
that in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. You have learnt. You will then give hope to others. You will witness to others. If you have confidence in divine providence. The third thing is this. God's purposes are not hindered by circumstances. Paul is in prison. Well, I mean, what good can he do in prison? Huh. He's stuck there in that stinking cell. He's, he's, he's without comforts. He's not got a plush uh, armchair to sit in. Uh, Roman prisons were not renowned for their comfort. They were bare places. You slept on the floor, slept on a bit of straw. You, there was no bathroom. There was no shaving facilities. There, there was nothing. The pictures you see of prisons in this country at this time are just the very opposite of what Paul's prison imprisonment was like. People had to bring food in. They wouldn't feed him otherwise. And what is Paul saying to us? Look, he says... I believe that God's providential and sovereign purposes are not hindered by my circumstances. They're not hindered by my poverty. They're not hindered by my emptiness and my, 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 my appalling condition. Quite to the contrary. God's purposes go ahead through my suffering and through my imprisonment. Same is for you. Your circumstances will not hinder God's purposes. Whatever you like. If God intends to condemn you, your circumstances will not change that. You can say this morning, well, I'm not going to be condemned. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. I'm going to, be, I'm going to live tidily. I'm going to, to wash and shave if you're a man, or I'm going to clean up my house, and, and God won't con condemn me then. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. God's purposes are not hindered by your circumstances. God's purposes are only changed by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and living a life of godliness and righteousness. And the last thing I want to say is this. Biblical realism produces joy. Listen to him. Look, he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. The letter to the Philippians is full of rejoicing. And he's rejoicing twice in this verse. I, uh -huh. Yes, that I rejoice, I will rejoice. It's only through biblical realism, through Christian realism, that you will have joy and others will have joy as well. And that your life will be changed. And that people will see that there is a spring in your step and a hope in your conversation. If your eye is firmly fixed on Jesus Christ and his purposes. What purposes govern your life? I can tell you what is governing your life. God's sovereign purpose. You're not a free agent. You're not a, you're not a, um, uh, a floating uh, bubble in the world. God has got your life planned. And his purposes are being fulfilled. You may say, well, that means if I'm not a believer, then that's God's purpose. I won't be a believer. No, no. That's not the way to logicize it. It's not the way to think. If you're not a believer this morning... There is a free offer of the gospel. Come to Jesus. Come and believe. That is God's purpose too. And if you come to faith in Christ, if you believe upon him, you will be doing precisely what God intended. Come to faith in Christ. And if you are in Christ, rejoice in the fact that your life is in the hand of a sovereign, eternal, and wise God, and that he is doing all these things for your good and for his greater glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you rule the world, that we are not the subject of some wayward spirit, but rather that we have a sovereign Lord who loves his people, and we pray now that you would reveal your will for us 
as we come to deal with the issue of uh, a minister for this pulpit. And we ask that you would bless us as we consider these things. Bless us now as we submit to your will and purpose. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.